John chapter 3, starting in verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. For everyone who does wicked things hates the light and does not come to the light lest his work should be exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in God. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside, and he remained there with them and was baptizing. John also was baptizing at Anon near Salim, because water was plentiful there, and people were coming and being baptized, for John had not yet been put in prison. Now a discussion arose between some of John's disciples and a Jew over purification, and they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, He who was with you across the Jordan, to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing, and all are going to him. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it is given him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom, who stands and hears him, rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in an earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. He bears witness to what he has seen and heard, yet no one receives his testimony. Whoever receives his testimony sets his seal to this, that God is true, for he whom God has sent utters the words of God, for he gives the Spirit without measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. This is the word of the Lord. Let's go to him in prayer. Our Father, we come to you and we ask for your help to understand your word. Lord, would you uh, soften our hearts? Would you um, open our ears to give us understanding? Um, God, in terms of our relationship with you as a people, would you bring comfort to the afflicted and would you afflict the comfortable here this morning? Teach us what it means to follow you, even as you teach us about yourself, and help us to know this from your word. We ask and pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I want to start with this thought. Wrong assumptions lead to wrong outcomes. Wrong assumptions lead to wrong outcomes. I was trying to think of an illustration to open this morning's message, and I was actually talking with my family around the dinner table last night. Some of you have noticed my mother and father are here. Anna and I have been thrilled to have them visiting for the last couple days. Dad just recently, uh, in the last year, stepped away from full-time pastoring. A little bit easier to be here on a Sunday with us now that he's not uh, pastoring in a church. He's actually a member of of the church where my older brother is a pastor. And I said, Dad, are you nervous? All those years, you made me your sermon illustrations. Now you're going to be here. And he says, no, my older brother does plenty of that, you know. Um, So uh, I thought, we're going to give Dad a break. In fact, Mom was willing to jump in. She said, what what topic? What what sermon illustration do you need? And I tried to play it off. uh, But we're going to give Dad a break. Mom, you might take the brunt of this one. I don't know if, if that's okay. So... I don't know, I don't think I've told you its potential. Did I tell you about the time me and my brothers missed the bus as we were kids? So early morning, you know, I'm the middle of uh, three, older brother, younger brother, and we had to go a block to get to the school bus. The, The bus didn't pick you up at your house. You had these, in the neighborhood, these appointed bus stop stations, and it was a two bus process. You got on the first bus. They, I see a couple of our Cedarville kids here. Uh, uh, did you ever make it to Shawnee Park? Either of you? It's this little park in Xenia. Okay, you're not missing much. Um, 
But you would get on the first bus, and there was a transfer station at the park there, just a half mile away, and you would switch buses so that you'd get to the right school then. Well, me and my brothers missed the first bus stop, and we're trying to figure out what do we do. And uh, if we go running home, mom or dad, one of them has to drive us the rest of the way to school, and we just decide, you know what, it is less than a half mile to Shawnee Park, the transfer station. We know exactly how to go to get there, and away we went. We got on our bus, and it was just a brilliant plan. We made it to school on time. In my mind, it was a brilliant plan. I'm forgetting exactly how this happened, but somehow by the time I got home from school, my parents knew all about our brilliant plan, and they didn't agree with all of the brilliance that I saw in the plan. I'm pretty sure, I would think it was because the youngest brother was still half-day kindergarten, and he gets home early and tells mom and dad all about our brilliant plan. (laughs) And here's what's motivating me. Here's the assumption I'm making, right? My parents will be pleased with problem-solving ingenuity, right? They will be pleased that they were not inconvenienced and didn't have to take us to school. That was not the assumption my parents were making. In fact, uh, uh, so the, the problem became, you know, it wasn't just that we had to go less than a half a mile. One of the busiest streets is what we had to cross, and there were no crosswalks. And it's like, how did you cross that road? Well, it's kind of like that game Leapfrog, you know, where you just go halfway and stop. And you can wait in the middle and then go the rest of the way. It's no big deal. To this day, I am convinced that if I could have gotten to my father before my younger brother and explained it, he would have said, smart thinking, kid. Good job. But I am pretty sure my mom was driving. Uh, the, the, whatever consequences were doled out that day, I believe my mom was behind it because the assumption she was making was that my safety was more important than her convenience. If you make the wrong assumption, you're going to end up with the wrong outcome. And it's true in all of life. What was important to me was not what was important to my parents. Well, there are some assumptions that you and I make. Let's transition this to the Gospel of John and to the story of Jesus and who he is. And as we approach Scripture this morning, when you and I read the Bible, you and I are making assumptions about who God is, who we believe him to be, about why God has given us his word, And if we make the wrong assumptions about who God is, you and I will never live our lives and have the right outcomes with how we live our lives. It just won't work. Here's the one thing if you're taking notes. If we don't understand who God is, we won't know how to live. If we don't understand who God is, we won't know how to live. And here's my concern, that there are many people who who read Scripture... Whether you are a brand new Christian or whether you are searching, trying to understand what it means, for all of you of high schoolers and young 20 college students, right, this is is important, this is as important for you as you read the Bible to come to an understanding of who God is, it's as important at your age as it is for some of our seniors that we look at, And, 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 and whether you are just starting or whether you are getting closer to the finish line, having a proper lens of who God is and reading the Bible correctly, if if you don't do that, you're going to make assumptions that that when life goes differently than you had planned, and when you see the reality that you're facing compared to what actually lives out in life, you're going to get confused, you're going to get hurt, you're going to get angry. You may end up hurting others because of your response. You've got to know who God is, or you won't know how to live. So what I want to do here is look at Scripture, and what we don't want to do. So often, when we come to Scripture, we we make the wrong assumptions about God because we read Scripture wrongly, right? And we take a very man-centered, self-centered approach, looking for ourself in these pages as as if God's design with the gospel was that we are the center of the universe and he wrote this book as a self-help book so that we would just know how to live. Well, that's not the reason God disclosed himself to us in Scriptures and that's not the reason God sent his son to die for us. God did it for 
his own glory, and he is the center. And therefore, when we come to Scripture, we want to get that right. We want to look at it and say, who is God? Because we want to understand then how to live. So as we go through the verses I just read, if you're taking notes, those of you that have the sermon outline, there's no points as we go through the sermon. On this side, if you just draw a line in the middle of your page, those of you that want to take notes and just think, as we walk through these verses, on the one hand, you're just going to be keeping track of who is God. What are the things you learn about God? What are his characteristics, his attributes, the things that are important to him? And on the other side of the page, how should we live? And whether you're taking notes in your brain or with your pen, as we go through this passage, see which side of the column it should go on. And I'm not going to necessarily tell you, as you're taking notes, what does God teach you through his word about who he is and how you should live. Let's start by looking through this passage, and let me start with verse 16. This is such a well-known verse, right? So many people know John 3.16. It might be the only verse of Scripture they know. You can't watch a sporting event without seeing John 3.16 on the screen, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. How did we get to here in John chapter 3? What's the context, right? Remember that last week we saw this interaction between Jesus and Nicodemus. And Jesus points out to Nicodemus, someone who knew the scriptures very well, he said, you have to be born again. In order to be a Christian, you won't see the kingdom of heaven unless you're born again or you have a spiritual birth. And as Jesus is teaching Nicodemus about this, one of the things he points out is that just as God's people were saved by Moses in the Old Testament by lifting up the serpent, so Jesus would be lifted up. And, and what, what, what eventually Nicodemus was going to see was that Jesus' own death on the cross was him being lifted up. And so as we conclude that little interaction there on verse 14 and 15, that anyone who believes in Jesus who was lifted up would have eternal life, this is the explanation. God says, here's how it happened. This is the way that God loved the world and gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have eternal life. This is how God did it. This is how God loved the world. By the way, one of the things I want you to see right here that helps you understand who God is and it helps you understand how you should live. Be careful when you read John 3.16, right? We know it so well that sometimes we make wrong assumptions about it. And, and this thought that for God so loved the world, we might read that as God loved the world so much that he gave his only son, right? But I don't think that's the best way to understand the so here. It's not, that, it's not the quantity of love that God loved the world with, but the manner, the way that God loved the world, right? And if you get this wrong, here's what it leads to, right? Perhaps you've heard this on the radio or uh, in little snippets of Christian thought and a devotional, whatever it might be, another message where someone is saying, listen, do you realize how much God loved you? And they, they will say, God loved you so much that he sent his son for you. Well, in one sense, that's true. But if you press that too far, it makes you think that your value is so great, that your value is so lovely to God, that he was willing to send his son to die for you. That's not what John 3.16 is teaching. John is not saying that you are so lovely that God loved you so much that he sent his son to the cross. What John is expressing here is that God is love, and he loved so much in such a way that he sent his son to die on the cross. You and I are the recipients of God's love, not because of our own loveliness, but because of the nature of the God who loves. Go to 1 John chapter 4. What does it say? God is love. In fact, one of the things you're going to see, we, we, we who read Scripture, we love to emphasize God's love for us. It's true. We should emphasize it. But one of the things you're going to see John emphasize throughout this gospel is not God's love for us as much as the love that God has for his Son and the relationship that the Son and the Father share in love. If you look down at verse 35, the Father loves the Son, has given all things into his hand. Over and over, John is going to emphasize how much the Father loves the Son. So we want to make sure we get this right and make sure we understand it. And he, here's what you and I need to walk away and understand, that the way that God loved the world was by sending his Son to be a sacrifice for our sins. That shows and demonstrates God's love, right? 
But if we're honest, we now face a tension at this point, right? There's an uncomfortable tension here that if God is love, if God loves this to this extent, then why wrath and why judgment? And if everyone who believes is saved, what about those who don't believe? It's a very uncomfortable tension that we have to wrestle with, is it not? So verse 16 says this, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. If I were to skip to the end of this section and go down to verse 36, whoever believes in the son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. That is a very succinct summary. When you sandwich those two verses together, it's a great summary of what this section is about, what this chapter is about, what John to this point has been driving at, right? God loves, and if you believe in his Son, life, eternal life. Those who don't believe, God's wrath remains. How do those two fit together? How can God be both loving and wrathful to the point that those who don't believe experience his judgment? How do these fit together? Here's my encouragement for you as God's people, as you view God, right? We don't want to make wrong assumptions about God and only pigeonhole him into one category or the other. And there are people that do both. They only view God as wrathful or they only view God as loving. Here, you've got to keep in mind both uh, this dual stance that, that God can be both loving and wrathful and the two fit together. Scripture takes that stance, so must we. And it, it's true from Old Testament to New Testament. Let me show you a couple in the Old Testament, right? If I was to go to the book of Ezekiel. You don't need to turn there. I'm going to read a verse for you. But Ezekiel chapter 18, the whole chapter is about, uh, uh, if you have a heading in your Bible like mine, it might say something like this. The soul who sins shall die. Well, that's encouraging, right? God is explaining judgment on his people. He is, uh, well, he's explaining this is the way you must live to be righteous. Make sure you do these things and you will live. If you disobey in these, we in these ways, death. Over and over and over, God is explaining this, right? Live this way to be righteous and live. If you mess up in these ways, you will die. But notice, notice the nature of God, that he doesn't just explain the wrath of his judgment. He says this in Ezekiel 18.23. Have I any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, and not rather that he should turn from his way and live? Just because God is a God who must judge sin with wrath doesn't mean he takes pleasure in it. And he does long and wish that people would turn to him in salvation. Same thing that you can see in the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 48. This isn't just true of God's people, the Israelites, like I pointed out in Ezekiel, right? Even Israelites' enemies, right? The people of Moab. They were, they were not God's chosen people. And in, in Jeremiah chapter 48... The whole chapter is judgment on the people of Moab, right? All these death and destruction, things being destroyed, judgment on the people of Moab. And look at verse 31. Here, but, but here's God's heart in this. Though he must judge with wrath, look at his heart. Therefore, I will wail for Moab. I cry out for all Moab. For the men of Kirhasheth, I Mourn. Verse 36, which you don't have on the screen, God says, My heart moans for Moab like a flute. Do you catch that? That God, even though God does judge with wrath, catch the love in his heart. It's true in the Old Testament, it's true in the New Testament. Go to Romans chapter 6, verse 23, where Paul speaks about this. And here's what Paul says in Romans 6, 23. He says, For the wages of sin is death. There's wrath, right? But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's God's love. Make sure you understand both of these because without both, you won't get a full picture of who God is. And this is what then John goes on to explain in verses 17 and 18 of John chapter 3. He says this, God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. That wasn't why Jesus came to bring a condemnation, but rather that the world would be saved through him. And John makes it clear that whoever believes is not condemned. That's how salvation happens. For those who have placed their faith and trust in Christ and who he is, what Christ accomplished on the cross, that's where salvation is received. But to those who do not believe is condemned already. 
Part of what you have to understand is you and I are born into the world because of our sin condemned. It didn't take Jesus to come to bring that condemnation, but rather we start life in rebellion against God, every one of us here. And what you have to think through and try to understand, have you been saved by believing in the name of Jesus? Have you realized that your own works and efforts can't bring you to God, but, but that only a relationship with Jesus Christ, trusting in what Jesus did on the cross for your the forgiveness of your sins, have you turned from your sins and trusted in Christ? That's what John wants to make clear, that that's where the new birth comes from. That's how it happens, right? And then if you look at verses 19 to 21, John does this real interesting thing. He, he, he simply says, this is how it works. If you look at verse 19 to 21, he says that judgment, this is how the judgment works. Light has come into the world, and he notes that people love darkness rather than light because their works are evil. He says everyone, everyone who does wicked things hates the light. They don't want to come into the light They're for fear of being exposed. But whoever does what is true comes to the light so that it may be clearly seen that his works have been carried out in darkness. He, what, what John is doing is helping us catch and see the difference that happens when somebody truly believes in Jesus. Now what you need to know about this, John is not saying that verses 19 to 21 is how you become a Christian. He is not saying, if, if, if you love light more than you love darkness, you'll be a Christian. He is not saying, if you do evil things, you're not a Christian, but if you do the right things and walk in light, that's how you become a Christian. He's not saying, these are not how-to instructions, it's simply a statement of reality, this is what happens. Somebody who believes, this is what it looks like. They love the light and not the darkness. It's a litmus test in that sense. By the way, Here's something that's kind of encouraging for us to see in verse 21, right? People who are truly Christians, people who get this and understand where the light comes from, they they don't want their works to be seen so that others look at them and say, wow, that person is great, right? Why do they let their works into the light, verse 21? When they do true things and allow themselves to be seen in the light, why is it? Not so that people would look at them and call them great, but so that others would see that these works have been carried out by God. That's what people who are truly born again want people to look at their life and say, wow, God did that. God is at work in them. That's what it ought to be for us in our life. And what you see in this section, right? As we talk about light and darkness and those who walk in the truth and those who want their works to be seen as those who do not, part of what John is doing, he's making this gospel delineation, right? He's been working on it now for a while. At the end of chapter 2, do you remember what happened at the end of chapter 2? We skipped over that section, but we referenced it last week. After Jesus clears out the temple in chapter 2, verses 24 and 25, John lets us know many people believed in Jesus, but Jesus did not entrust himself to them because he knew what was in man. And what you're seeing is John is saying, listen, there are some who truly know what it means to follow God. They're truly born again. And there are others who do not. They are still in the darkness. And John is helping us catch this delineation. And he's saying, here's what their lives look like. Here's what their works look like. And then he steps away, and we get this little historical account. And you kind of get an interesting description. Speaking of works, if you want to know what the works of someone's life is like, um, he lets us know about, well, here's an interesting interaction between John and his disciples, between John the Baptist and the disciples of Jesus. So you get this little historical account. So kind of leave aside the things I'm talking about, about the gospel and the plan of salvation, and let's pick up this little historical story where there's this disagreement that happens, right? And in verses 22 through 24, what we find out is that uh, Jesus now leaves the city proper, and he kind of goes out into some of the more rural areas, and there's a place where there's a lot of water, and John the Baptist is baptizing people with his disciples, But you also get this account that Jesus has disciples. This is the only one of the Gospels that mentions that Jesus' disciples were also baptizing. And a little bit later on, uh, it's going to be made clear that Jesus himself wasn't doing the baptizing, but his disciples were. And both groups are there. 
And, and the text, John the writer, lets us know that people are continuing to come to John the Baptist and he's baptizing them, right? So that's important to note here. This text doesn't go into why are they being baptized different than the baptism that we saw last week in believer's baptism where a Christian comes and says, I've repented of my sins. They want to make that known before everyone. It's not salvation. It's just a means of identification. What's taking place here in these baptisms, it's also a means of identification with their message, but different than the believer's baptism. So what happens here at this point? If you look at verse 25, John the writer lets us know that as this is going on, uh, there's something of a discussion, but it's more like a debate or an argument, or there's some kind of conflict between the disciples of John the Baptist and a certain Jew over purification. We don't get any more details than that. Who is this Jew? What was the argument about? Did it have to do with baptism? We don't know. There's a little bit of indication that uh, John's disciples are the ones that started it. Uh, And there's some disagreement going on, right? Whether they were the ones that started it or not, or it was brought to them, um, there's a disagreement. And John the writer doesn't zero in on it, but he lets us know something very interesting happens next. Look at verse 26. And they, so this is the disciples of John the Baptist, came to John and they said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you across the Jordan to whom you bore witness, look, he is baptizing And all are going to him. Now, this is really significant what happens here. Here you're going to get a real good picture of a group of people who don't understand who God is. And they end up having the wrong outcome in some of the judgments they make. And you're going to get a real good picture of one person, John the Baptist, who does have the right understanding. And the choices he makes in his life are completely different than this group. And it, it, it's really neat to see. Do you notice what they say? They come, and they don't even name Jesus by name. To them, Jesus is nameless. They remind John, he's the one you gave a start to. They come to John the Baptist and they say, listen, you're the one that got him going. The only reason people know about him is because of you. So that guy that you gave a start to, everybody's going to him. It says all are going to him. Now, people who are disgruntled often exaggerate the truth. All were not going to him. John the writer just let us know that people were still coming to the Baptist. But, but now they're upset, and, and they bring it to John, and what you see happening here is just a textbook example of jealousy, jealousy at work in ministry, right? And when you boil jealousy down, what is taking place in jealousy, jealousy at its root, right? And here's where our assumptions about God, when we get them wrong, it has a dramatic effect in how we live our life, right? At its root, jealousy is nothing more than not being content with God's assignment or God's assigned portion, right? Jealousy at its root is not being content with God's assignment or his assigned portion. At its root, it's thinking God has made a mistake. It's a lot like garden language, right? With the serpent coming to Adam and Eve. Does God really know? Do you ever see jealousy play itself out in a ministry context? Do you ever see this happen in churches today, right? Is it easy to think that that one person watches another person's ministry, right? And and jealousy begins to work out, right? So there's times where, where ministry decisions need to be made and physical space needs to be juggled around in the church building, right? And why did they get the bigger classroom compared to what I got, right? Why did that person's request get approved and mine didn't? Why did that person get listened to and I didn't? Why is their ministry growing and mine isn't? Why didn't I get picked for that special leadership role? You hear Pastor Kevin mention a possible missions trip to Germany that's going to be explored. Can you imagine jealousy setting there? Why did so-and-so get picked to go on the Germany trip and -and so-and-so didn't? Can you imagine how jealousy could unravel the purpose of a trip? You end up overseas, right? You end up overseas, and one of the things they got to figure out is who's staying where and what houses for a really small church that doesn't have enough room to house everybody. And they got to figure out, 
are we using Airbnbs? Are we using hotels? What's going on? And you're sitting there thinking, oh, they get the pool in the backyard. Comfy beds. I got like this dormitory with mice running around in hard bunk beds, right? And you're like, wow, how'd that happen, right? Why do they get the prominent ministry assignment? They're out there ministering to, to families and children on the playgrounds, and I'm back here making the peanut butter and jelly sandwiches so they have something to eat, right? Could you imagine how that would unravel things? But it doesn't, jealousy doesn't just happen in a ministry context, right? It happens in all of life. As you think through, why did God give you the job he gave you and the other job to someone else? The house he gave you and another house to someone else. The health he gave you and the health to someone else. The children he did or didn't give to you and the children he did or didn't give to someone else. Well, how do we deal with this when we try to understand what is God's call? on Who, who is God and how should I live now because of this? Here's what the disciples of John the Baptist think. They're bringing this complaint to John, and they think he's going to commiserate, right? They're, they're hoping he's, yeah, you're right, let's go over there. Let's, let's throw mud in their water, right? That's, I mean, that's what they're hoping. And how does John the Baptist respond? Notice what he says in verse 27. John answered, A person cannot receive even one thing unless it has been given him from heaven. Do you catch John the Baptist's response? Why are you upset? God's the one who gave this, and God cannot... It, uh, someone does not receive even one thing unless God is the one who sent it from heaven. He's, he's referring to God's providence, right? As we understand God's sovereignty, in God's providence, whether you want to use the word order or decree or allow or ordain, everything God does and allows would not happen in your life or someone else's life unless God gave it from heaven. Do you believe that? As a church, we just sang those truths. He has told every lightning bolt where it should go. And if God tells the lightning bolts where to go, he picks our houses, he picks our health, he picks our jobs, he picks our ministry assignments, he gifts people the way that he wants. He allows these things for his sovereign purposes. And who are we to get angry at God and other people? And yet we don't believe we're angry at God. We look at leadership, we look at the people that made the decisions, and we say, this isn't right. And we get angry. And here, John's disciples were hoping to cause problems, and John the Baptist just sidesteps it. And he just says, nope, nope, God is the one, and this can't happen apart from him. And, and, and then he, he goes on further and gives just this really beautiful illustration. John knows his assignment, that he's merely living the assignment God's given him, and he refers it to a wedding. We've already seen some of the wedding analogy throughout the book, and John comes back to it here. John the Baptist points out, and he says, listen, uh, this is the way that it is, right? You, you were there. You heard me say that I'm not the Christ, but I merely bear witness, right? I'm just getting the bride ready for the bridegroom. That's already come up in the book, and John reminds them of this, and he says, you, you, the one who has the bride is the bridegroom. It's the groom that gets the bride. The friend of the groom He's just excited that the wedding is taking place, that his friend gets the bride. Well, in this day, in this age, in this culture, the friend was something like the best man on steroids, had more responsibilities. And the best man had a lot of responsibilities to make sure everything came together. And John the Baptist says, I'm not the groom. Why would I get in the way? I'm just excited that the groom is coming for his bride. Being a pastor, I get the chance to go to a few uh, more weddings perhaps than some, or at least maybe get a different angle on some of the weddings, working closely with the bride and the groom. Uh, here's the analogy that John uses, right? I've seen things go wrong in weddings, things that aren't maybe up to the bride's expectations. I've noticed when the bride is disappointed because things are not quite what she was envisioning, right? I've seen a few different scenarios. We could trade stories about some things that have gone wrong, right? I'm pretty sure we could all tell all of our stories about weddings and no one would have a scenario like this. Here's the analogy he used. The bride's upset because the best man isn't getting enough attention in the wedding. 
Has anybody ever been to that wedding? You ever seen a bride that's upset because the best man isn't getting prominent spotlight? It's unthinkable. And that's John the Baptist's point. This is unthinkable. I can't believe you're upset that people are going to him to be baptized. John knows what his assignment is. He gets it, and he wants to live it. Why? Because he knows who God is and the outcome that that's supposed to have in his life. Listen, if you're struggling with jealousy, if you're struggling with being content with the circumstances, your problem is not a horizontal problem with these other people in your life. It's a vertical problem with knowing who God is and living to be content with him and his purposes. John gets it. He must increase. I must decrease. Here's a characteristic, a litmus test for people that know who God is. This is the way that they will live. And as you go to verse 31, we step away from that little historical example. We kind of come back to some of these gospel truths, right? And John ties some of it all together. And he he really has statements that summarize the whole chapter and and, uh, coming through the points he's been making to the book. And he says in verse 31, he who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth belongs to the earth and speaks in earthly way. He who comes from heaven is above all. John says, do you get it? John the Baptist is from the earth. John the writer is pointing this out most likely at this point. And Jesus is the one who's from above. It's very significant to help us understand. John John knows what his assignment is, and he doesn't want to get off track. By the way, if we look at a couple of words that help us understand this, if, if you jump back to verse 27... John answered, a person cannot receive even one thing. The word person there could be translated man. It's the exact same word for man. In fact, it's the exact same word that was used in John chapter 1 verse 6. There was a man sent from God. Same word. And so what John the Baptist is saying, a man cannot receive even one thing unless it's been sent from heaven. He knows he is that man who has been sent. He's just from the earth. And the one who's above, and by the way, that word, the one who's above, that's the word for born again in chapter 3, verse 3. You must be born again, or you must be born from above. Same word. And here John, the writer, is helping us understand. The one who is above and from above, he must be above. He has to have the prominent place in our lives. This is the way that it must be played out. And John got it. He knew that he was just a man sent. And he had to come. He had to bear witness to what he had been given. And he knew that, he, uh, that some would reject the testimony, verses 32 and 33. Some would receive the testimony. But those who received knew this, that God is true. By the way... It's not just that those who received Jesus knew that Jesus was true. Jesus was connected to the Father, and if they received Jesus, God is true. And that's part of what he wanted him to understand. He knew that he was uttering the words of God, verse 34. He gives the Spirit without measure. Jesus came to utter God's words, and throughout, to this point in human history, God's prophets and messengers received the Holy Spirit in measure, right? They received an allotment, so to speak, of the Spirit for a ministry and a task. Jesus received everything of the Spirit without measure. See Jeff Bowen's class on the Holy Spirit for more. They, I think they're in week two this week. And, and this was God's example of what he wanted to do through Jesus. The Father loves the Son. He's given all things into his hand. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. Here's one final point of application as we're trying to think and understand. Okay, who is God and what outcome does that have in our life, right? Well, on the one hand, the gospel has been, the the message of the gospel has been throughout this message, right? That if you believe in the name of Jesus, if you trust in what Jesus has done on the cross for the forgiveness of your sins, you will have eternal life and be saved. What does that mean to believe? Well, again, there's another litmus test here in this verse, right? Verse 36 says that he who believes in the Son has eternal life. And some of you are sitting there saying, and you say, good, I believe in Jesus, right? I know Jesus died for my sins. And so you... uh, you, 
the rest of the verse says, whoever does not obey is what my translation says. But some of your Bibles say, whoever rejects the Son shall not see life. Some of your Bibles say, um, whoever does not believe shall not see life. Well, the word here is stronger than just not believing, or it's different than the word not believing. And I think even better than the word rejecting, the word means to not obey. It means disobedience. Notice the antithesis of belief is not unbelief, right? If you're sitting here trying to evaluate, do I believe in the name of the Son of God? You're not off the hook if you just simply don't say, well, I don't believe, Good, I'm not an unbeliever, therefore I must believe. What John says is that it's whoever does not obey. How do we know if you believe? By your obedience to the Lord's commands. That's where you see. Now notice what John is not saying. Don't hear what I'm not saying. I am not saying that the way to be born again is obedience. It's not a how-to. It's a litmus test of what is simply true. What already is, right? If you're not obeying, I don't care what you say about your belief in Jesus, this unrepentant pattern of sin, that your life can be lived any way you want, Scripture does not give you assurance that you are born again. And this, this is what we need to understand, right? Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. You've got to understand who God is. Don't have a wrong assumption. He is loving, yes, but he is also wrathful. And those who walk in disobedience demonstrate their unbelief. So how about you? Do you believe in Jesus? Are you walking in obedience to his commands? Do you show that by your contentment to whatever it is that God has sent and ordained? That does not mean that it is not hard to come to that contentment. That does not mean that you might not struggle with those thoughts of jealousy. But it does mean that you come to God and seek to order your hearts and thoughts and attitudes and behaviors that over time he would change them to be in conformity of the image of his son. So that with John the Baptist you would be able to say, I don't receive even one thing unless it's a gift from heaven. And then you say, with my life, he must increase, I must decrease. But may that be the true message of our lives. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we, we want to live according to your word as we ought. We want to be people who, who see God in all of God's glory, in all of your glory, for the truth of who you are as both a loving God and a God of wrath and judgment. And would we recognize Jesus' work on the cross as payment for the forgiveness of our sins? Would we respond to your love and turn in salvation to faith in Jesus Christ? Would you encourage those here who are seeking to walk in the light to see where areas and places of our hearts still need to come into conformity? We ask and pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.